good morning and uh, we just want to say thank you for allowing us to share some of your Sunday with us here this morning and we're going to continue our sermon series about revolution this is week number four and so by week by the first three weeks everybody's kind of gung-ho they're kind of excited you've got a little bit of uh, um, vitality to you but by week four something really really critical starts to take place because we understand that there's a lot of discipline that goes in into the Christian walk and so it becomes a little bit easy to start losing focus or it becomes a little bit easy to stray away from our revolution many of you have already you may have even wrote it down during during the revolutionary sermon series this is what I want to see God do. Some of you have already wrote it down. Some of you want God to bless your relationships. Somebody wants God probably to increase their marriage or to help them as a parent or, or to help them at work or maybe find something else in, in their field of occupation. But wouldn't it be sad if you got really, really close, you started getting really close, but then you got wearied, you, you got tired, you got fatigued. You know, something really phenomenal takes place during... January and February. Membership in the gyms go up. Guess what happens in March and April? Pe pe people stop going. So this morning I'm going to preach on leaving no room to turn back. You're, you're on the pathway. You're, the revolution is close. It's so close. Don't give up. And I want to read a scripture that talks about a radical, a radical example of leaving no room to turn back. First Kings chapter 19. First Kings chapter 19, starting in verse 19. So Elijah went and found Elisha, son of Saphat, plowing a field. There were 12 teams of oxen in the field. And Elisha was plowing with the twelfth team. Elijah went over to him and threw his cloak across his shoulders and then walked away. Elisha left the oxen standing there, ran after Elijah and said to him, First, let me go and kiss my father and mother goodbye, and then I will go with you. Elijah replied, go back, but think about what I have done to you. So Elisha returned to his oxen and slaughtered them. He used the wood from the plow to build a fire to roast their flesh. He passed around the meat to the townspeople, and they all ate. Then he went with Elijah as his assistant. Would you bow your heads with me as we look to the Lord in prayer? Heavenly Father, I just want to say thank you for allowing us to come and assemble in this place. I want to thank you, God, for allowing us to get to be into your presence. And Lord, I pray that right here, that you would allow our hearts to be still so we can hear your word, we can hear your voice. God, we want you to speak in a very clear way, and I want to pray that we all would respond in a, in a fashion that would bring glory and honor to you. And we ask this in Jesus' name, and God's people said. Now, there are very seldom ever are you going to find anybody this radical within the Scripture when it talks about selling out completely. I mean, you can understand, uh, follow along with me, you can understand the fact that he's plowing with oxen, and he's probably worked pretty hard to earn those oxen. I mean, we, we know what oxen are, right? We know oxen is actually, it's just a bull. It's just, just been castrated. Just specifically for the purpose of being a, a, a beast of burden. And then, not only do you have to do that, you have to be able to put them in a yoke. So you have to train them and condition them how to work the yoke. And he's plowing with them. But one day is a little bit different. A man of God by the name of Elijah comes by, throws his cloak upon his shoulder, and says, I want you to follow me. 
I, I want to start mentoring in your life. I want to start making investments in your life. This is a transformational call because you're plowing one day and now you're going into the unknown the next. And I want you to listen how radical this is. So these beasts of burdens that he's trained how to plow, how to work in the yoke, not only does he kill them, but just to make sure that he can't even go back because you've got the yoke and you've got the wooden plow left, he uses those to burn the animals as sacrifice. There is nothing to go back to. I want to encourage our hearts that we're on this pathway. We're on a passage. We're on a journey of revolution this morning. And I don't want you to get weary. I don't want you to get discouraged. I don't want you to drop your gym membership. Can I get an amen? I want you to take heart. I want you to be encouraged. And this morning, I want to preach on four ways how we can make no room. And point number one, make no other option. There is no other option. I would say that today, when couples enter into a marriage relationship, that unless that they look at this particular point strongly to say, make no other option. When they enter into this marriage relationship, they are making a covenant before God. Can I get an amen? They're making a covenant before God. The third going to allow the Lord to help be in the center of this relationship. However, if we start to enter into any relationship with the thought process well i'll just hang in there and and and, until it's okay i'll I'll just hang in there just as long as things are good but when things start getting bad i'm i'm here to tell you i don't care how good looking she is on monday morning she's going to wake up with bad breath can i get an amen and I, i i don't care how many muscles that he's got today you wait till he turns 40 somebody needs to say amen something something magical start see you see i used to have a big old chest i used to look like an anchor i hit 40 and i dropped anchor went down here somebody say praise the lord that's what happens woman falls in love her eyes fall out of her head she marries prince charming about 10 years later he turns into fuddy-duddy that's what happens you see we watch just watch the little video where Cortez said, I'm not leaving any other option. We did not come here to turn around. And God has not brought you this far in your revolution journey for you to turn around. Let me, let me just share some thoughts on making no other option. Letter A, we have to condition our mind for the long term. That is so against the culture of the United States that we live in today. The biblical foundation is you think in terms of long term. That's, that, that's, that's what the scripture is teaching us to do. But here, we want instant gratification. The, the scripture is full of, Uh, both Old and New Testament of planting and harvest examples. That's long term. But we in America, we're so used. Listen, when the banks are closed, where do we go? We go to an ATM because we want money and we want it now. Right? I mean, and how about this? If you don't have the money, what can you use to make your purchase? Credit card. Man, we are a very impatient. We are a very impatient culture. You, you know what one of the fastest growing businesses in America, unfortunately, is? It's fast food. We can't even get our food fast enough. You can, listen, fast food came out and, and it, it just, it sold tremendously. But now we can't even get it fast enough. Now we go to Little Caesars where they already have pre-made stuff. You go in and buy it and like in less than two minutes, you're out the door. We are a very impatient culture, but... To make no other option, we need to get into the mindset. We need to condition our mindset for the long term. Secondly is, or letter B, long-term mental attitude that teaches us we're in it to win it. 
I want everybody, I want everybody to say right now so it resonates as a part in their soul to say, I'm in it to win it. Say it with me. I'm in it to win it. Say it again. I'm in it to win it. Some of you have started college. Some of you, you're on the pathway of, of going into school. And no doubt, school is hard. School is tough. It's been a long time since I was in. And school's going to be hard. But if you say, I'm in it to win it, then you're conditioning your mind because you are saying it. Man, it makes such a big difference. Did you know Jesus, Jesus made the statement, he said, no one putting their hands to the plow, looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God because their focus, their focus is somewhere else. And I would dare to say that sometimes I have even been guilty myself. I've, I've, I've been in church and I've heard singing, but my mind was somewhere else. Can I get an amen? Just kind of lack of focus. Maybe, m m maybe I was thinking about what I had to do on Monday. Or m maybe I was thinking where I'm going to eat after church. Can I get an amen? See, I'm, I'm not focused. I'm not focused enough. And we've all, I mean, almost like every single day, you hear somebody who's trying to text and drive. Just trying to text and drive. You, you, you're not focused. Revolution can't come in your life. Revolution can't occur in your life when you're not focused. As a matter of fact, the, the third area that we're looking at here is many people fail because of their mental attitude. It's not that they don't possess the physical power to do it. It's because that they have convinced themselves in their head that they can't. The Apostle Paul is, is pretty phenomenal in the fact that he makes a great statement of faith in Philippians chapter 4, verse 13. We're talking about somebody who's been beaten. We're talking about somebody who's been shipwrecked. We've been, we're talking about somebody who's been forsaken. He's been stoned and left to die. And yet he says, he has the boldness. He has the courage. He has the mental fortitude that says in Philippians chapter 4, verse 13, he says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 12, verse 3, it says, Do not be weary and faint in your mind because that is where the struggles are going to be. The struggles are not within your body. And I want everybody to take heart. You do not live. You do not live by the power that is on you. You live by the power that is in you. Point number two. Throw our best effort on proper goals. Throw our best effort on proper goals. I want to I just want to be honest with us here this morning. We're we're in a race. It's called life. And life sometimes is very hard and life sometimes is not fair. Can I can I just get an amen <laughs> from from that? Life is just not fair. But I'm glad that God's not fair either because if God was fair, he'd give us our just reward. God's not fair. God, God is gracious. And this morning, when we throw our best effort on proper goals, we're, we're learning just what Elisha is doing. Elisha realizes, I've been called to a greater purpose. Now, please understand, you can serve God and plow with oxen you can serve God and raise a garden you can serve God and do other things that's not the point today but there's going to be a time in your life where God calls you to a greater purpose and you're going to have to respond you're going to you're going to have to literally you're going to have to literally chew on this and you're going to have to step out and this is how that we can do it first of all you ensure that you're that you are establishing good and healthy goals and if I've got good and healthy goals, uh, you've heard us sort of talk about uh, the transition that's happening at the Bryan household. Man, it is hard, but it's getting a little bit easier. You know, we're like where you, where you don't have soda pop in the house and you don't have cookies and you, you just start to learn to snack on countertops and bath towels. You just somehow, no, I'm just joking. 
we have peanuts and we have healthy, we're, we're all making healthy stuff in the refrigerator. It's either a juice or you have, you have bottled water. If everybody's with me, say, say amen. You know, see, it doesn't do you any good to say, you know what, we want to start making some healthy choices, healthy lifestyles. But then you allow yourself to bring in the junk food because then it, it doesn't match consistently, right? And you're setting yourself up for failure. So we ensure that we are establishing good and healthy goals. Young people, if you want to set a good, healthy goal, and, you know, because it is so important, it's going to be so competitive, when you graduate from high school and you try to go into college or you try to go into the, the workplace, man, it's going to be super competitive. Right now would be good for you. So in order, in order for you to make good grades, you're going to have to go to bed at a good, decent time. You're going to have to shut off the video games. You're going to have to get off of Facebook. You're going to have to do those things. And you're going to have to discipline yourself to ensure that you're establishing good and healthy goals. And then secondly, we place our energy as what we see as important. Staying up and chatting. It's cool. But sometimes what is cool doesn't always equate as what is important. And so we want to place our energy in what we see as important. And let me just say this. Success is not how much energy you spend. It's where you spend your energy at. Some people think, man, if I, you know, if I just, if I spent more hours of the day doing this, I would be successful. No. It's not how much energy that you spend on it. It's where you spend the energy at. I mean, we have to have balance. The Scripture teaches us that. We have to be able to have focus. And then that leads us to point number three this morning. Stay engaged with progress. This is going to be real important because there's going to be times in our life where we're going to feel like we're not moving very fast at all. But God is with us. His Spirit is helping us. And we can make some real progress in life. If we just continue to keep putting one step in front of the other, our revolution starts to unfold. I can remember when I was first learning how to play guitar. And uh, I would come home, and like, as soon as I came home from school, for about the first 30 minutes, I'd pick up my, my father's guitar, and I would learn these chords, and I would learn them, and I would learn them. And, 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 and it was kind of awkward, because your hand's not used to going in certain positions. And I, w I would work on it, and work on it, and finally I could get the key of G, and I could start getting it clean. And then I'd start working on, a, on another key. But there would be weeks, there would be certain weeks where I seemed like I would be at the same level day after day after day, just not seeing progress. And I would get so frustrated when I would see somebody pick up a guitar and it just like it would be so effortless to them. But you keep plugging. Your revolution will take place. You just got to keep plugging. You got to keep chipping. Here today. I'm going to ask you to write down three things. I'm going to ask you to write these down because these will be some building blocks to help you stay engaged with progress. We're talking mind over matter. And this is what I want you to do. First of all, when we talk about staying engaged with progress, right now I want you to start listening to your local K-Love Christian station, which is 90.3. And on Caleb, believe it or not, they have a 30-day challenge for 30 days. <sighs> Raise your hand if you like talk radio. Raise your hand if, if your blood pressure ever goes up when you listen to talk radio. <laughs> this is what I want you to do. For 30 days, listen to nothing but Caleb on your radio. I'm not saying country music's evil. I'm, I'm, I'm not saying 60s is evil or anything like that. I'm, I'm just saying... We want to make progress. We want to put our energies. We, 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 want, we want the Spirit to be able to just kind of speak to us and allow us to concentrate. So for 30 days, I want you to listen to Caleb. 
And don't worry, I'll come back next Sunday and I'll ask for a show of hands how many people are listening to Caleb. So I want you to listen to Caleb. And you know what? Your attitude, your attitudes are start to start to change, won't they? You'll start to see a revolution start to take place with you know cuz you know Caleb plays very uh, positive and encouraging music. So so listen to Caleb. Secondly, I want you to stay engaged with fellowship. So uh, I want you to do this. I want you between now and through the next, I want you to go all the way I want from here. I want everybody who is here, I want you to go from now at least to, to Easter. And I want you to, I want to try not to miss a Sunday. If, if you can't make a Sunday, we do have Saturday services. So I want you to write that down. I want you to stay engaged with fellowship. And we're we're going to kind of mix it up a little bit each and every Sunday uh, when we have time of fellowship and Saturday when we have our uh, weekend services. We're going to kind of uh, change it up how, how that we just done this morning. We want you to say something positive. Next Sunday, it'll be something a little different. So we want you to stay uh, in fellowship. And then thirdly, I want you to stay engaged with prayer. So for some of you, maybe maybe as soon as you get up, uh, maybe the, the best time for you to pray is like as soon as you get up because nobody else is up. Or maybe some of you, maybe you like to kind of stay up a little bit later. You might want to watch the 11 o'clock or the 10 o'clock news. And right before you go to bed, make sure that you're praying to keep your heart sensitive for this revolution to take place. So stay engaged with progress. Do those three things. And I think within the course of next weekend, when next weekend rolls around, because you see, God doesn't call you to smile only when, when you feel good. And God doesn't call you to smile just, just when the kids are healthy and when things are going all right and you've got money in the bank and, 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 and the hair looks good and the hair's not falling out. But, but what, about, what about when the car won't run, your hair starts falling out, the, the kids act like they're, they're possessed by the devil? Because you see, there is where people want to have that other option. They, they, they like, oh man, this, you know, I'm still living for Christ. I, I'm, I'm just pulling back. Jesus still loves me. And I'm, I'm still saved. I'm, I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. But man, this revolution stuff is just so hard. It's, it's difficult. And this, this is where so many people, they, co- they come, they get so close to having a much deeper, much more explosive relationship with their Savior, Jesus Christ. But you see, God doesn't call us to serve him when things are only just going good. God calls us to serve him when, when it's bad weather outside and, and when it's bad weather inside of your heart as well. We are called to do that. Point number four. It's probably the best, best one of all. It's the best point this morning. is respond to God's calling now. Did you guys catch what Elisha does? I mean, this is, this is a radical move. The same day that he gets his call, he doesn't say, let me consult somebody else. You know, uh, you know I, I, I once read in, 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 in a book that so-and-so, when they were faced the same way, this is what they did. Well, h- hold on. I, I, I remember watching an episode on Dr. Phil, and this is what they did. No, 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 no. That's, that, that's not what we do. You respond to God's calling. Stop Stop looking at other people because God's calling in your life is unique and it's singular. It's for you. And so when God calls us to do something, because this is what happens inside of the human mind. This is what happens in the human psyche. Is God speaks to us and we start to swell up inside and we start feeling the Spirit just tugging at us and then we just kind of push it away and say, well, I'll, I'll think about it. Well, as soon as I get home, as soon as I do this, then that's what's going to happen. We get home, we kick off our shoes, we make us a cup of coffee or we grab us a, a glass of milk, we get some Oreos, we sit down, we start watching TV and that call is not as burning inside of our heart. Most people try to just rationalize it away. But that's not what Elisha does. Elisha says, God is calling me to something higher, to a greater purpose. And so Elisha 
goes back. He kills the oxen, takes the plow, takes the wooden yoke, uses it to burn as a sacrifice unto God and to leave no other option. Today, we're calling us into a deeper relationship with the Lord. Today is our day to leave no room. And maybe there's some people here who've, maybe they feel some bitterness or maybe they're harboring uneasy feelings of guilt and shame and maybe unforgiveness. I'm going to ask you this morning to be just like Elisha, to make that sacrifice, make, get rid of any of those things that would entice us to step away from our revolution for God to work and do something in our life. Diane, I'm going to ask you to come down. I'm going to ask you to, to come and pray. I'm going to ask everyone to stand, and I'm going to ask uh, the Lord to, to speak to our hearts as we get ready to have our song of invitation. Would everybody stand? I'm going to ask you to bow your heads with us. Heavenly Father, today is a, is a great day, and today I know that you want to speak to people's hearts. I know that you want to do something very significant in the lives of people who are here this morning. And God, may we be sensitive and may we stop holding on to things that just kind of hold us back. May we stop trying to rationalize reasons why that we can't step forward and and, and enter into this revolution in a much deeper, more purposeful way. God, help us right here and right now to slay the oxen, to burn the, the plow, the yoke, and God, that we just dedicate completely unto you. We ask it in Jesus' name.